Hey there, welcome to the show. It is Tuesday, August 25th, 2020, the year that seems to never end. My name is Les Solgrove. Uh, this is the Des Moines Real Estate Market Update. I'm with Via Realtors, and it is week 34 uh, of, of this uh, crazy year that we're in. And I uh, want to introduce a guest today that I have with me, Ted Weaver. Ted is uh, on the Clive City Council. Clive of course, everybody knows it's a suburb of Des Moines. If we get somebody from out of the area, we want to let them know where Clive is. Clive is uh, quite a unique uh, community uh, in our metro suburbs. And um, I want to welcome you, Ted. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Les. Great. So how long have you been on the uh, city council at Clive? I know you've been involved for several years, but how long has it been? I have. I initially started out uh, on various committees uh, with the city starting in about 2008, um, ran for election in 2009 uh, for the first time, lost that election by about 100 votes. And uh, but because I put in a, a good campaign, we, the council had a, a vacancy due to a job change and I was appointed in 2010. Uh, okay. So I've been serving since 2010 was reelected in 2011, 2015, and then last year, 2019 for a full four-year term. So four-year term, yeah, well, very good. Well, we've uh, we've known each other for several years and, and you're also a, a fellow realtor as well. So that you've got some right. great insight that uh, hopefully you'll be able to help us out with today on kind of what's going on in the, maybe the real estate market there in, in Clive as well. So, so if I were to ask you what Clive is best known for, um, I, I know what I would expect you to tell me. What what would you tell me uh, that Clive is kind of best known for? Sure. There's, so there's a couple things that I would I would point out. First and foremost is our Greenbelt Trail. Uh, we can say we don't have a downtown Clive per se, so we consider our Greenbelt Trail is kind of our main street. It is uh, about almost 12 miles. It's about 11 and a half miles of trail that runs right through the heart of Clive. Uh, it's canopied with trees uh, along most of it. Um, you, you, um, are, it's adjacent to numerous businesses where you can stop and, and have a beverage. Uh, lots of parks that are along the way as well. Um, and it connects to the Des Moines Regional Trail System. So you can pretty much get anywhere in Des Moines from that Greenbelt Trail. So it's really what we consider to be our crown jewel of the community. It's something we invest in literally every year uh, to maintain it and, and improve it. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's one of the great amenities uh, of our city. Uh, we have a lot of houses that, that abut up against it and it, they have wonderful views uh, of the trail and of, of Walnut Creek uh, directly adjacent to it as well. So, so certainly I would start with the Greenbelt Trail. Uh, the other thing I, I like to point out, and this is certainly important for realtors, is that we have the lowest uh, non-subsidized uh, tax levy, property tax levy in the metro. So we're at about $10 per uh, $1,000 of assessed value. Uh, so now I, I say non-subsidized because Altoona, um, I believe, last I checked, they still had a slightly lower tax levy rate, but they're subsidized by Prairie Meadows with their general mm -hmm. fund. So that allows them to get a little bit below us. But from a non-subsidized standpoint, uh, we have the lowest uh, tax levy in the metro. And, the mayor, our mayor loves to say that we're, we're the best deal in the metro. You still get great services, you get great parks, great amenities, but you get it at a low cost. And so I, I would start with those two things. That's great. That's great. Well, I would fully concur. I've sold uh, houses in Clive all the way up and down the line over the past years. And, and uh, it seems like people don't typically want to move out too well. They want to move in, but they... You know, they don't yeah, it's, it's so centrally located, right? So, that you can pretty much get anywhere in the metro very quickly from Clive. So it's it's a it's a wonderful location. Plus, again, the, the city amenities are, are really top notch as well. Yeah, it gives you a feeling of of you know living out in the country while you're still right there and close to the city. So correct. Well, very good. I've got uh, of course the picture, the screenshot of the. Uh, Clive website and a couple of uh, great photos that I've snagged out there, as well as the green belt. So you can do, you can see it. So like 11 miles long. That's just a fantastic trail there. So, uh, of course, we had the the storm here a couple. Well, it's going on two and a half, three weeks ago now. Is it two weeks ago today? I think it was. Um, two weeks ago yesterday, I believe. Yes, I'm sorry. Two weeks ago yesterday. It was a Monday, right. um, and. 
I know that a lot of the areas in the metro are still doing cleanup. And uh, tell me a little bit about what kind of damage Clive experienced from the storm, both uh, along the trail as well as in the city and, and the retail and and, and uh, housing. You bet. So, I mean, we, we had, you know, we had quite a bit of damage just from, from a tree and debris standpoint, not a lot of structural damage that I'm aware of. Um, basically, the way our crews uh, organized it was that we, we sent our our Parks and Recs Department with our tree chipper out west, so west of the interstate, and then they began working east um, in order to pick up the debris and all the trees that the uh, curbside collection um, allowed for. And so they were chipping those trees as they went. Um, and again, that started from the western portion of the city and began moving east. And that started a week ago, Monday. Mm -hmm. And then on the east side of the community, when you kind of go over to 73rd Street and work your way west, that's where we saw the heaviest damage. That's the older part of Clive, right. uh, a lot, a lot of uh, large trees. Um, and what we had to do with, with that set, that side of town was we sent our dump truck out uh, with our backhoe. And um, because the, the debris was so large and so extensive, uh, it was unreasonable to expect our residents to be able to chop those up into small, smaller sections for the chipper to work. So we had our backhoes and our dump trucks out uh, east with our public works department, and they, they are still working on that. Uh, they're, last I heard, they're about up to 86th Street uh, in that area. And so they're, they're uh, hauling all of that heavy debris over to County Field. And if you don't know where County Field is, it's basically if you think of where our aquatic center is, just the north of that, north of the creek, there's a big open field. And so that's where we're taking all the chips and, and the large debris. And then we have an industrial size chipper there to handle the, the large debris. And, and so both sets of uh, crews, the one working west to east, the other east to west, and hopefully going to meet in the middle. We expect to be done probably by the end of this week is wow. the, the intention to have everything cleaned up. But I mean, that gives you a sense for how extensive it was. Yeah. Um, that it's taking that long to get all of this debris out there. Well, and your services, city services are probably much smaller than, than like the city of Des Moines where they get mm -hmm. dozens of trucks and things. But, so it sounds like you guys have made great progress and uh, uh, hopefully some of the federal funding, disaster funding will will trickle down to your community as well and kind of well, offset. That's our expectation, yeah. That's a FEMA, well, we're, we're gonna apply for a FEMA grant and be able to get reimbursed for a lot of that. I mean. You know, we're going to have so many wood chips that it's going to take multiple uh, semi trucks to remove it to the landfill. Um, now it's open; it's free for anybody that wants it. So if if anybody wants, you know, some some wood chips for, for their own lawn, uh, they're welcome to come by County Field and grab it. Um, we're hoping to uh, collaborate with a number of the uh, uh, suburbs up on the western side of town uh, to try to. to have a combined service because we're all going to have this need. So let's get one contract with one supplier at a reduced rate by having us all do it uh, collectively. So that's, that's the intent. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. So, well, um, so I, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you're also a realtor and we were talking a little bit before the show about how the real estate market has kind of affected you and, and this year with COVID, how, how has your business been this year? Are you kind of uh, up, down, kind of steady? What? what yeah, it's been, it's, it's been up, up and down, I think, like a lot of folks. You know, the beginning of the year was a little bit slow, uh, probably a little better than last year, but, but a, a little slow start to the year. Um, then COVID hit in March, and I personally had about a three-week period where everything just kind of stopped. Yep. And um, of course, while you're in the midst of that, you don't know that it's only going to be three weeks. Right. And, and so right. certainly was hopeful. Uh, and, and what I tried to do was continue to uh, communicate with my past clients. Um, I created what I called a, a quarantine relief kit with uh, a roll of toilet paper, a bottle of water, some ramen noodles and just some, you know, a crossword puzzle book and things like that. And I went and delivered it to all of my past clients because I wasn't really doing anything else. 
And, and um, you know, it, it, it was a fun way to reconnect. I kept, kept my distance from all of them, gave them a relief kit and everyone got a good laugh out of it. And, uh, you know, everyone was stuck at home. Everybody, you know, at that time, nobody was working uh, unless you were an emergency uh, you know, responder. So uh, it was a great way to reconnect with past clients. And then, uh, you know, soon thereafter, much like everyone else, the market picked back up and everything was going gangbusters. And so uh, it, was a, it was a very good summer, very active summer for me. Um, you know, things have slowed down just a bit here as school's starting back up, but that's pretty typical. Um, and I do have a, something of a pipeline here going into the fall that I'm hoping uh, is gonna gonna do well. That's great. Well, it sounds like uh, you've experienced pretty much what everybody's experienced. Um, you know, this extended spring market that's going uh, really all the way into to fall here has been been quite amazing. So, all right. Well, um, as far as uh, just to give a quick update on the Des Moines side of, of the cleanup here, so I'm not ignoring uh, the city as well here of Des Moines. Um, I've got a website up here and this is, uh, if, it's kind of a long URL, but if you just go to dsm.city, there's a link on the homepage of the city of Des Moines website that uh, talks about debris pickup. And one cool thing that they've got going right now is they actually have a debris map that uh, pip up, pick up map showing where all the cleanup is happening as of right now. And let me zoom in here just a little bit. You can kind of see the green areas are the areas that are already completed. Yellow is uh, in progress, blue is next, and then the gray area is standby. And like what you had mentioned, Ted, the city of Clive started at one end and worked kind of towards the middle. Uh, the city of Des Moines is kind of working its way from the center outward, which kind of makes sense because um, again, the, the way the city of Des Moines was originated, it was kind of in the middle and worked out. So a lot of our oldest growth and and uh, trees are there and, and it just kind of makes sense. So I'm on the south side here in the standby zone, but I, I'm not complaining because I know that they're they're working, you know, 48 hours. Working hard. Those crews are out there working every day for many hours a day and, and, and on some hot weather. It so is it's just, very just amazing. And, and of course, you know, with, we can't uh, end this portion without thanking all the crews that came in, the linemen that came in from around the country to help us with the cleanup and getting our our uh, electricity back up and going. And and I know there many are still over in Cedar Rapids. We've I've got family over in Cedar Rapids as well. And they're still struggling over there a little bit. So, um, well, you know, the pretty much the entire metro, um, all of the municipalities got together um, immediately after the storm. Uh, via the Polk County Emergency Management um, uh, Commission. And they had a, a Zoom call with all the city managers on there and, and they all kind of collectively decided that it was the right thing to do for the cities to do this curbside pickup of all the debris that they yeah. couldn't expect the residents to do that. And there would be no charge for that. That's just part of what your tax dollars are paying for. So yeah. it's not just limited to the city of Des Moines or, or Clive. Uh, it's pretty much all the metro communities are doing this. So um, all you have really should have to do is go to your city's website and, and get more information if you need it. Great. Well, well, thanks for uh, for joining me today. Uh, brought a lot of information about uh, the city of Clive, and I appreciate that. And um, uh, ask you if you'd like to join me here for the rest of the the show. Here, I'm going to just kind of zip through some slides uh, that we typically cover each week um, about market stats and. Uh, if you've got a comment, I invite you to just jump in and, and ask a question, uh, Ted, or if you've got a comment, just you know, speak your mind here because this is a lot easier if it's a, a back and forth. Yeah, so, no, it sounds great, happy to do it. Yeah, so um, of course all the stats that I produce each week, um, I produce about 35 or 40 different graphics and they all go on to Simply Des Moines Stats on Facebook. Uh, as a photo set. And so if you just search, you go to Simply Des Moines Stats on Facebook and then go down to the photo section, you'll see the photo albums. And week 34 is the week we're on and you'll see all these stats. This is just an example of of the dashboard. And um, I've got people that look at this and they, they just about fall over. And then they look at this and they go, well, this is so great because it's got everything on it. Um, and it's just a uh, just a one one graphic that will basically tell you the entire story of the entire market. And a couple of things I want to point out here is our year to date closed sales. We'll talk about this near the end of the of the, the presentation here. 
but we're as of last Sunday, we're at 9,800 uh, homes year to date closed. And that was about uh, 700 and some ahead of last year. So even with the pandemic, even with uh, our own version of a hurricane, we are we are uh, well ahead of last year on closings. And um, we're going to talk a little bit here in a minute, too, about this uh, inversion, this market inversion that we're in here. So um, let's kind of just jump in and, and uh, talk a little bit about months of inventory. That becomes pretty important as we move into the fall. And months of inventory is a measure of the amount of supply of homes we have for sale and how fast that they are selling. And so if you look at the green line here each week, I kind of bring this one up, you'll notice that we're at 1.8 months of inventory. And that means that if no new homes were to come on the market in just under two months, we would sell out of all of our, our homes for sale. Um, compared to a year ago, we were at 3.3 months of inventory. So, you know, it's over 90 days of inventory versus uh, just almost 55 days right now. And um, that's just, that's quite amazing to be at this stage this late in the year. And to take this graphic one step further, I realize this is a spaghetti graph and it can be really confusing. I break down the four different segments of our market. Uh, single family resale is blue. Sing, uh, condo townhome resale is the uh, orange, the gray is new new construction single family, and then new construction condo townhome is the yellow. And if you look over here in the far right corner, if you can see it there, it's 1.3 months of inventory for single family. So remember we were at 1.8 months overall, but we're just over, just over a month still uh, of inventory with a uh, single family. And that's normally around that two, two and a half months of inventory right now. So. Just, just a, a odd, odd market. Now, new construction um, is tailing back up here a little bit. They're about three and a half months, and then the condo townhome. You'll notice it's between these uh, red lines. This even market, four to six months, is what we consider like a balanced market in our in our uh, area. Um, if we have between that amount of inventory, that kind of gives a buyer plenty of time to find a home, and sellers plenty of time to maybe sell their home while looking. And that makes them feel pretty darn comfortable. So if you're working with buyers right now, or if you're a buyer yourself out there, the it probably feels a little bit uncomfortable because, uh, you know, unless you're in that new construction condo townhome market, um, you know, you're still kind of having to, to make a decision fairly quickly as, as you're out and about there. So, you know, uh, to start contrast from the uh, old the recession days when uh, we had, quite uh, higher numbers in the months of inventory. Yes. Sometimes double digits. No kidding. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, and, you know, we've been in this kind of a market here really the last five or six years, but it's really been uh, deeper this past year with, with everything that's going on. And um, we talk a little bit about the number of homes for sale because that's how this months of inventory is calculated. And I run a calculation on those same four categories that again there's that single family uh, resale uh, in order for us to get up into that balanced market we would need about 2800 more homes to come on the market so right now we're 2800 homes short and honestly we're not going to see that i mean you know around the first of the year maybe we would see it you can see we started out in january pretty you know pretty balanced but that's pretty normal because that's when everybody's kind of you know, holidaying and, and, you know, waiting for the snow to stop. And uh, man, once the market really jumps, that's where we see that. So um, remember I said that the new construction condo townhome had between that four and six months inventory. Therefore it has zero shortage. It's right in that sweet spot. It's got just enough uh, homes for sale. So just kind of an interesting graphic. Um, one graphic that I've been kind of following here, and, and I've got a new one that I'm going to show you next, uh, but this one is the price reductions versus last year. And, you know, when the market is hot, you don't see a lot of, of price reductions. You don't see a lot of price changes, uh, at least pricing coming downward. Um, the red line on this graphic indicates 2019 where we had price reductions. So we were having price reductions pretty steadily throughout last year. And price reductions, while they're still happening each week, they're at, you know, about half of what we've uh, been seeing. 
And I think that's just, again, a testament to the fact that we have such low inventory. Sellers are not having to, um, you know, make the, the price reduction as part of their, their strategy here. However, look at this graphic. <laughs> this is brand new. Uh, this is price increases weekly. And one that I've been, been following here is, you know, you'll see a surge every once in a while. Like week seven, we had a, a price increase here. And that was predominantly uh, new construction kind of coming on saying, you know, okay, it's the new year. Um, let's add some, some, uh, you know, either, either costs have gone up or let's, uh, let's add some features to these new construction homes, which is going to increase the cost. So they would, of course, then they'd see a price increase. And we've seen a couple of those throughout the year, but this past week, um, Sunday night, I'm doing these stats and I said 121. I said, that can't be right. I must have done something wrong. And I started looking and I, I started pulling up all 121 of those homes. And the, the vast majority of this is new construction. And um, some of the prices, you know, this doesn't tell you what the price increases were, but some of them were just a couple thousand, you know, maybe the, you know, upgrades in in features and things like that, or maybe just appreciation of values that they're trying to bump in. But there were several in there that had a five and eight, maybe $10,000 increase on their new construction pricing. And the only thing I can think of, and Ted chime in here, the only thing I can think of is uh, the cost of materials have gone up and the availability of materials with um, this past year uh, has gone up dramatically, especially locally here. And, and do you think that's possibly part of the reason, Ted? Right. Yeah. I, I, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, any other proximate cause for that. And I do know, you know, uh, there's also a lot of home remodeling going on. Uh, I've talked to some contractors who are, are, are doing, you know, new decks or, or remodeling of homes and they're booked out through the spring. Um, you can't get anything done right now. And, and their prices are going up because of that same reason. So I, I think we're seeing it in both sectors. Yeah, uh, I, I've got some uh, outdoor decking that needs to be replaced. And frankly, I've not been able to find uh, any material right now. So uh, right. very well could be exactly the cause here. So, um, and so I'll watch this here again in the next couple of weeks and see uh, if we see more um, of these increases. And if I do, then I'll see if I can't run some kind of reporting to see what the, um, you know, maybe the average uh price increases are. If it's just a couple thousand here or there, it's not a big deal. But well, I was seeing several that were several thousands uh, uh, on new construction that were bumping up. And that yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to know, though, to be able to caution your buyers who are on the fence looking at new construction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, I've sold a couple of new construction homes here this last week, a uh, couple weeks. And um, a lot of the picks have already been made, you know, countertops and cabinets mm -hmm. and and appliances and things because they say they have to make those early on. Otherwise, they'll never be in in time for the closing. So yeah. anyway, it's just always every week is, is something new here. So <clears throat> um, so this is, uh, again, that year to date uh, homes for sale count um, compared to last year. We're at 2,772 homes for sale right now where we had 4,093 a year ago. Um, that's, you know, close to a 50% um, drop in, in our inventory for sale. And it, it's just, uh, it's just a, a hard thing to, to really fathom. If you look at it going back all the way to 2009, you can see, I said before, we were, we've been in this situation since about 2016. Um, but as we started 2020, we were kind of poised right here. We were poised to continue to rise. <clears throat> and instead we actually dropped because of COVID. And this little dip right here is, is a little bit of leveling off that we're seeing right now. Um, the same kind of thing is happening in the sale pending counts. Again, we're at 2,262 homes as of last Sunday that were, I'm sorry, 30, 3,374 that were in the uh, closing pipeline. 2,262 was a year ago. And we, you know, my thought was that this number was going to continue to go down some, but it seems to be leveling off. This is the number of homes that are waiting to close. Um, so if you're out there with, a, you know, trying to do refinances, this doesn't take into account refinances. <laughs> this is just uh, real estate uh, transactions where you're doing a purchase. 
uh, got to believe that the refi business is is even even higher than than uh, what we've got going right now. Um, you can kind of see that we are seeing a little bit of a uh, a drop off when you go back to a 11 year look back here. Um, but we are still well ahead, even over last year's high. You know, there was the peak in 2019. Here we are. Um, we could be into October before we even get down to that level. So just kind of crazy information there. So, so Ted, we talked a little bit before the show, and, and I alluded to it during your portion about uh, being in an inverted market. And really what that means is when you overlay the homes for sale and the pending sales overlay that daily tracking um, where this crisscross is here is where we went into this in inverted market. And what I mean by inverted is that we have more homes impending than we have for sale. And um, I do have it on here. You can see where COVID-19 kind of came into play here. Um, but let's take this uh, one slide ahead here. There's your inversion point. And this area that's in yellow here kind of indicates the, the speed or the, the pace of our market this summer. And this is what makes us feel like we're really in a spring market still. Um, we start to feel this when these two numbers kind of come together in the springtime. But we've never, in my experience, in all these years, I've never uh, seen it uh, crisscross like this. Hmm. And... Um, I really believe that until we get out of this inversion, that uh, it's going to take some time. But before we get out of this inversion, we're going to continue to have this really fast paced market, even though it feels like it's slow right now. There's a lot of uh, business still being conducted. And so the question is, is when will this end? And if you kind of try to do a little trend line here and project downward uh, for the pendings and then same thing for the. Uh, active homes right now it's kind of leveled off so if we took that leveling and right where this crisscrosses would be the same as this one that's going to put us almost to the end of October at this pace before we get out of this crazy market um, you know things could change but just look at 2019 here you know the pendings it, it doesn't go down that fast it's more gradual and I've kind of got it going down a little bit faster than than what we did last year, only because I just expect this to kind of tail off quicker this year with it being an election year and everything. Um, the homes for sale typically is on the rise until we get around Thanksgiving or close to it, and which it goes down. And we're not seeing that either. So, um, you know, this is kind of that point that I'm saying that we could still be in this inverted market all the way uh, up through maybe the end of October. So. I think this is the next to the last slide. This is uh, talking about single family home pricing trends. Um, we, we do get homes on the market every day. Um, <clears throat> and over the last week, we have seen the, the median price of single family resale homes. I separate that out because that's the bulk of our business, single family resale. You can see that we are uh, actually dipping down a little bit where we were around that 275 mark. We're under 270 right now, which tells me that the um, you know the lower end price points are kind of coming back into the market, and that could just start this whole process back over again if you get low end housing, because uh, that's well, where the ones that tend to sell super fast. That's right. That's right. And the yellow line, which is kind of overlapped by the the red sold, this is the pendings, um, because these are coming down. You can see that people are buying that little bit lower priced home. So um, you know it's just going to be kind of fun as we go in. Oh, yeah, I guess I do have a couple more here. We got uh, weekly open houses counts here. I'm going to just kind of zip through these. Uh, this week, we had 563 opens, 351 were new construction and uh, compared to last year. So this is the complete number of open houses this year. And this is the red line is where we were last year. So you can see we do have uh, quite a few less open houses this year. Some of that is just COVID. Some of that is the fact that we have fewer homes for sale to be held open. So, and then there again, there's our 752 closed transactions ahead of last year. Um, this is going to put us on target. Uh, if everything stays the way it is and gives us all the indications that we're going to continue, this will put us at right around 15,000 uh, closed transactions for the year, which is about a thousand more than, than 2019 had. 
And, um, you know, it's just, that it just means that, um, you know, this, even though we've been through a hurricane, we've been through a, you know, COVID pandemic, um, you know, things are, are just uh, still chugging right along. So anyway, with that, um, you know, thanks for joining me, Ted. Um, next week, uh, September 1st, I'm going to be going over my month end report as well as the weekly report. It'll be week 35. Um, I hope you'll join me, Ted. I hope you'll, um, you know, subscribe. Everybody, encourage everybody to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's the best way at this stage, although it's broadcast both on Facebook and on YouTube. So, any last words of wisdom for us? No, that's great information, Les. I know I plan on using some of that. With, I have a listing appointment coming up on Thursday, and I'm going to use some of that information. So that's great stuff. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining me. And um, we kept it right at 30 minutes. So we'll go ahead and give it a uh, thank everybody for joining us today. And we'll see you all next week. Thanks again, Ted, for joining me. Thanks, Les.